So this is a case study of a patient with advanced stage atrial fibrillation and what his option was and what he ended up doing and what kind of lesion set he required. So this is Mr. JB. Mr. JB is a 60 year old man who came to me with a history of advanced stage atrial fibrillation. He actually was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation by his primary care doctor. I mean, he felt like there were some issues, some rapid heart rates, very active, very healthy, very athletic, just kind of blew it off. But he went to his primary care doctor and found was found to be in continuous atrial fibrillation. Then they did a heart rhythm monitor on him and it showed that he was 100% in atrial fibrillation with you know, fairly fast heart rates. Now, this gentleman was highly educated and he did lots of research and he actually saw multiple electrophysiologists for multiple opinions. So the first electrophysiologist, and remember, this is a very healthy patient who doesn't really have many other medical problems. His heart was strong, healthy, he didn't have high blood pressure or diabetes, various other things, Never, no previous strokes, no weak heart. And so all he had was symptomatic AFib and he was in it 100% of the time. So that would put him at persistent or possibly persistent to longstanding persistent atrial fibrillation stage. So the first electrophysiologist he saw recommend, well, slow it down with one of our rate controlling medications, metoprol, which they did. And then because he was fast and you know having some symptoms and athletic, it was impacting the quality of his life, they suggested an antiarrhythmic drug to suppress it. Now, as I've said in other videos, you have to decide which drug to use based on the stage of your AFib, because there's different strength levels to the AFib. And this patient having a more advanced stage of AFib, a persistent or long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, would require a stronger drug, probably the third strongest drug or stronger, sotalol or dofetilide or amiodarone. Instead, this electrophysiologist put him on the weakest drug, flecainide, and considered doing a cardioversion to shock his AFib back to sleep and see if that would last. And well, the, the patient didn't really feel like from what he understood that that seemed to make a lot of sense. So he went to a well-known electrophysiologist in South Tampa. And this electrophysiologist evaluated him and said, you know, I don't think that drug would be strong enough. Let's use the strongest drug. He actually put him on the strongest antiarrhythmic drug, amiodarone, which is the one that can suppress AFib the best, and when it fails, it's usually when your AFib has progressed to virtually permanent, probably would not be the drug I would have chosen at 60 years old for long-term suppression because it's the one that has long-term side effects. If you're on it for more than five to seven years, it could cause damage to your liver, your lungs, your eyes, or your thyroid. This guy's only 60 years old, so what's gonna happen in five to seven years if he stays on that drug, even if it works? But he actually put him on the strongest drug, loaded him with it for two weeks, and then cardioverted or did a simple electrical shock to shock the rhythm back to sleep. Unfortunately, this patient's atrial fibrillation was so strong on so many walls of the heart, his forest fire, so to speak, was so big that even the strongest drug couldn't keep the AFib asleep. And after eight days, it woke right back up. He was in it 100% of the time as if they hadn't done anything. So the second electrophysiologist started talking to him about an ablation procedure. But remember, the vast majority of electrophysiologists only do simple one wall ablation, that first wall. And in this patient's case, he likely would need more than one wall because he's an AFib 100% of the time. If you're only an AFib at an early stage with one wall, you're only an AFib 10, 20% of the time. If you have two walls, you're in it 30, 40% of the time. If you have three walls, you're in it 40, 50% of the time. If your AFib has progressed to four walls, you're in it 60, 70% of the time. Five walls, 80, 90%. Close to six walls, you might be in 100%. So not everybody does complex ablations. Many people just do simple one wall ablation on everybody and then it's incomplete. They have high redo rates. Success rates drop from the standard 70, 80% in early stage cases to 40 to 50% in the middle stages to 20 to 40% in the late stages. And so this electrophysiologist realized that doing a simple one or two wall ablation wouldn't be enough. So he was actually recommending a convergent hybrid ablation, which is a two part procedure where a surgeon does an ablation on the outside of the heart surgically. This would be if this is the chamber where AFib is, the left upper chamber of the heart. Well, the, the back wall here, so here's the pulmonary veins. This is the back wall. And most people just do the corners, which is where the pulmonary veins. It's a simple one wall ablation. But there's a convergent hybrid ablation that's targeted for persistent or long-standing persistent AFib. Because if you just do simple pulmonary vein isolation, success rates drop down to 40 to 50% for persistent middle stage or 20 to 40% in the later stages. And so realizing that, he said, well, why don't we do a conversion hybrid ablation? And so that would be 
where the surgeon does a hole right here underneath your breastbone. And then they go up and they ablate the entire back wall and part of the floor. And then at a later time, the electrophysiologist goes in from the inside and they do the four corners. So how many walls does that actually equate to? Well, it's kind of like the corners, which is one area, then the back wall, that's the second area, and then a little bit of the floor. So maybe two and a half walls out of the six walls. Definitely a much more complex ablation than just doing the corners or the first wall. Studies have shown that a conversion hybrid ablation in people at middle stage persistent AFib increases the success rate from 40% up to close to 60%. Definitely a little bit better, but not outstanding. And so he had the patient go to the surgeon, talk to the surgeon, and it was going to schedule it for that. The patient did more research, found my YouTube channel, watched my videos, where I discussed the functional approach where I can do all six walls if necessary from the inside without having to do two procedures and without having one of those procedures be a surgical procedure on the outside of the heart, which remember, takes a lot more time to recuperate from, sometimes five to seven days because they're making a hole to the outside of your heart. And we talked about how I could do those three walls that they were talking about doing in one procedure and potentially more if he needed it. So he ended up deciding to have me do the procedure, which was just done around May of 2025. And in his case, he was in AFib during the procedure. I didn't have to wake it up. It was just constantly in AFib. In fact, they couldn't keep it asleep even with our strongest drug. And what lesion set did we end up doing? Well, we did do the corners, the pulmonary veins. That's very simple. Everybody can do that. I did that. Then I did the back wall where they were going to do with the conversion hybrid. That would be the second area. I did some on the floor. They are able to touch the floor directly. I go into the floor because there's actually this vessel here called the coronary sinus, which runs along the floor. And I actually enter that vessel from the right chamber, upper chamber of the heart with my spaghetti-like ablation catheter. And I actually cauterize the floor of this chamber through that thin wall vessel. It's, very, it's a more advanced technique, but it works very well. So I did the pulmonary veins, that's one part, the back wall, a second part, the floor, the third part, everything they were gonna do with the conversion hybrid, it wasn't enough. The patient was still in AFib. So what did I do next? I did the side wall where this pouch-like structure called the left atrial appendages, I went around it, what we call partial isolation of the structure, electrical isolation, partially, and I got rid of signals there. And then he had a bunch of stuff on the front wall, which is the front part of this, and I actually made a line across the front wall to interrupt signals. That's like the fifth area. And with that, his atrial fibrillation actually converted back to normal rhythm. It wasn't like I just did the back wall or the pulmonary veins and then shocked the rest back to sleep, which is what you know they would have done and hope for the best. I actually went until the AFib stopped on its own. That told me I hit all the right areas. And then I stimulated his heart electrically to see if I could wake up anything more. I could not wake up any more AFib. What I did actually wake up was the second most common abnormal heart rhythm called atrial flutter, which is a little circuit here on the right upper chamber of the heart, actually along the floor of it which is a very common secondary rhythm. 30% of people with AFib develop a flutter, 30, 40% of people with atrial flutter develop AFib. And so I actually made a little line on the floor here, got rid of that circuit. And so I got rid of all his AFib. I got rid of the induced atrial flutter, second most common abnormal rhythm out of the 15. And then I couldn't wake up anything more, all in one procedure. And he actually went home the same evening. Sometimes we keep people overnight just to recuperate from the anesthesia. He was doing great and he wanted to go home the same day. And he's been doing great ever since with no issues, with one procedure, one procedure from the inside. So let me just contrast that very quickly with another patient who has contacted me through the YouTube channel. And this patient had a very similar situation. He's 65 years old, out in California. He found himself to be an AFib 100% of the time. They actually did load him with the strongest drug, amiodarone. They didn't shock him back to sleep, but they loaded him with that. And eventually he came off of that, but he went to a well-known, famous academic institution in California. And they went ahead and they started by doing the first procedure. They just did the back wall, the one wall pulmonary vein isolation, which is these four corners. And they used the newest technology, pulse filled ablation, so it didn't take them very long. And then they shocked the AFib back to sleep and stopped the amiodarone. Well, after two or three months of things dying off, he was better. He was no longer 100% in AFib, but now he's going in and out of AFib. So they didn't get rid of all of it, but they definitely made it better. So they brought him back for a second procedure. And then they told him, well, we couldn't really wake up any AFib, but we did wake up the second most common rhythm, atrial flutter, which is in the floor of the right upper chamber of the heart. So they did a little ablation there and got rid of that. So now he's got two procedures under his belt. And guess what? He's still having AFib. 
So now we went back to them and they're saying, okay, well, I guess you just need a third procedure. And now they're talking about doing a hybrid convergent ablation for more advanced AFib. Like the first patient was being told, that's where the surgeons will make a hole to the outside of your heart and do this back wall and then the floor. And still that would just be three walls. But what if this patient ends up being like the patient I did where he had needed five walls to get rid of his AFib or even all six of his walls? Even the hybrid convergent ablation would not be enough. So the point being made here is, if easy is easy and hard is hard, if you have an early stage AFib, all you have is AFib cells on that first corners of that first wall, then I don't really care who you do it with, what institution you do it with, and what energy sources you use, whether it be pulse field ablation, which is the fastest, or cryoablation or radio frequency, which is just as effective, just slower, have at it. Easy is easy and hard is hard. But if you have a later stage AFib, persistent or long-standing persistent, where you could have three, four, five, or even up to six out of the six walls worth of AFib, then it may matter a lot who you go to and who does your ablation. It could be the difference between one, the patient I did, needing only one ablation from the inside instead of a two ablation a strategy, one surgical, one from the inside that would have just done three walls, which still wouldn't have been enough in his case, versus this other gentleman who went to a famous academic institution, is now had two ablations and counting and is headed for a third that may or may not even work. And the second ablation was just that secondary atrial flutter, which we did from the inside because we woke it up during our procedure. So easy is easy and hard is hard. At the later stages, I do think it makes more of a difference who you go to. It could be the difference between multiple ablations that may or may not work versus possibly just one. For everything atrial fibrillation related, please feel free to go to my website, drscottlee.com, where you're gonna find more resources and also can follow me on social media.